c'est pas très visible, donc vous irez euh, voir le poster <rire> à l'extérieur. Euh, donc avec Claudine Alag, depuis euh, maintenant, euh, enfin, moi je suis arrivée euh, sur la route avec Claudine, et donc Claudine depuis de nombreuses années euh, au centre de Soissons fait des observations euh, annuelles sur les différents décors que nous avons à étudier, et donc régulièrement on observe la présence de sous-couches, euh, pour la réalisation des décors. Et euh, cette journée d'études était pour nous l'occasion de juste euh, mettre à plat les observations que l'on a faites. Évidemment, euh, ce ne sont que des observations euh, visuelles. Aucune analyse n'a été réalisée pour euh, euh, ces sous-couches. Et comme je, je l'ai évoqué tout à l'heure, évidemment, euh, je l'ai évoqué et puis je l'ai un, un peu démontré, l'apport de l'archéométrie est vraiment indispensable et donc si un étudiant souhaite entreprendre un sujet d'étude, l'étude des sous-couches est vraiment très intéressante et notamment dans ce, cette perspective, la, la stratigraphie, l'observation stratigraphique des échantillons pourrait apporter vraiment des arguments pour préciser l'utilité de, de ces sous-couches. Euh, donc évidemment on rencontre euh, des sous-couches euh, très souvent sous le cinabre, euh, donc on peut observer généralement une sous-couche jaune. Euh, on pense que la présence de cette sous-couche est liée essentiellement à des raisons techniques pour la fragilité de ce pigment, mais aussi euh, pour euh, des raisons peut-être économiques, ce qui permet euh, de réduire la quantité de pigments, puisque c'est le pigment le plus onéreux de la palette que les peintres ont à leur disposition. Donc c'est deux choses, mais évidemment, ce sont des hypothèses d'interprétation. Euh... Ensuite, pour le verre, alors le verre, on en a un petit peu parlé, les sous-couches observées pour le verre sont soit jaune, soit rose, et là, de nouveau, lié à la technique, mais là, plutôt un problème pour étaler ce pigment un peu capricieux, il semble que les, les peintres apprécient de d'abord euh, appliquer une terre sur l'enduit pour faciliter cette application de, de, de la terre verte. Euh, pour les exemples que je vous ai montrés tout à l'heure, il n'y a pas systématiquement de sous-couches, notamment pour la céladonite. Euh, alors le bleu égyptien, lui, la raison semble tout autre, elle semble davantage optique puisque les sous-couches sont observées sur, euh, pour donner une tonalité différente au bleu égyptien, et notamment des tonalités plus violacées ou plus foncées. Donc le bleu va être appliqué sur du rouge bordeaux ou sur du noir, et dans ces cas-là, le pigment est grossièrement broyé. On ne va pas avoir ce, ce pigment soit soigneusement préparé que l'on peut avoir pour les, les champs bleus, euh, que l'on a ailleurs sur le décor. Donc là, il y a une volonté euh, plutôt de, de coloration du, du pigment. Euh, pour le noir, euh, il y a une présentation récente, enfin, c'est en cours de publication par euh, Hélène Ristoff et, rappelle-moi, et Delphine Burlot euh, sur les champs noirs. Et donc on observe effectivement très souvent pour le noir une sous-couche rouge. Euh, qui parfois du coup fait que le noir n'adhère plus très bien et du coup la sous-couche apparaît très clairement sous ce pigment. À Soissons, on a pu observer la présence de noir de carbone et aussi de noir de manganèse, euh, tous deux appliqués sur cette sous-couche. Euh, donc là, il y a la problématique liée à la tonalité du noir qui est très difficile à rendre sur un enduit blanc qui a tendance à virer au gris. Donc est-ce que c'est de nouveau une volonté pour intensifier euh, ce pigment ou est-ce que c'est de nouveau lié à euh, l'application du pigment euh, donc euh, voilà un peu les, différents, les différentes observations que l'on a pu faire mais qui nécessiteraient vraiment une étude rigoureuse appuyée sur euh, des observations euh, archéométriques et notamment une stratigraphie avec la mesure précise des couches et des sous-couches parce qu'on voit très nettement, notamment ce qu'on a vu ce matin, toutes les stratigraphies que l'on a vues, notamment pour l'Italie, on voit clairement, quand il y a du cinabre, que le cinabre est très finement appliqué euh, sur l'enduit. Et donc ce serait intéressant d'avoir les mesures pour, euh, pour, 
pour ce, rien que pour ce pigment-là, qui est quand même euh, très particulier et, et un révélateur social. Voilà. Donc j'encourage je, l'archéométrie. <rire> Et bonjour et je veux bien remercier l'organisation pour l'invitation et surtout pour la parfaite organisation. Et je vais commencer pour, euh, avec deux ou trois mots sur la cité romaine de Biblis. Vous savez tous, vous savez tous que c'est le lieu de naissance du grand poète martial. Et elle est placée sur la vallée de l'Ebre, au nord-est nord de l'Espagne. Et même si elle a, si elle a des origines celtibères, il faut dire que son processus de romanisation est bien renforcé aux années 40-30 avec la concession de l'Ius Italicum, et qui, comme nous le montre les monnaies, la série numismatique. Et à l'époque d'Auguste, la, la cité reçoit les statuts municipales, les statuts de municipium, et c'est à ce moment-là où commence la construction de tous les centres civiques avec les théâtres, les théâtres et les forums. Et on ne sait pas encore pourquoi, mais une ville dont on a mis beaucoup de travail pour ses, pour ses caractéristiques holographiques, et, et, et détruite déjà, ou abandonnée, on peut dire abandonnée, euh, vers le milieu du XIIe siècle. Et la maison dont on va, dont on va, dont on, on va, oh, je vais vous parler, est, elle, elle est placée au centre, de la, au centre de la ville, tout à côté des forums, et c'est une grande maison italique, avec un plan italique très caractéristique et des richesses, autant euh, du point de vue de la décoration comme du point de vue du reste architectonique. Et elle, a, elle a été construite à la, vers les années 40-30 avant Jésus-Christ, c'est-à-dire au moment de la concession de l'Ius Italicum à la, à la cité. Je ne vais pas décrire les peintures parce que vous voyez bien les, dans la diapositive les caractéristiques. Et ce qui est très important, c'est la présence de deux rideaux en, dans les, dans la partie basse. Un rideau qui tient et, et, à des représentations de, des clous des têtes trapézoïdes. On voit très très bien et qu'on n'a pas pu montrer dans, la, dans les posters pour des raisons d'espace. Et comme je vous ai dit, elle est datée à la, vers les années 40-30, on dira 30 plus tôt euh, avant Jésus-Christ. Les échantillons qu'on a choisis pour faire les analyses des pigments, ce sont les, les, les couleurs de la partie moyenne de la, du mur, c'est-à-dire les bleus, les verts bleutés ou assurés, je viens de savoir que ça s'appelle mieux assurés, non Plus que bleutés, et les, les rouges portants. On a les analyses qu'on a fait et on a utilisé comme technique les spectrométries des de fluorescences des rayons X. On sait bien que c'est une technique très très basique, mais il nous a, il nous a fourni des, des résultats très très importants. Et pour les, pour les rouges bordeaux, et les, les pigments, on va commencer plutôt par les, la verre bleutée. Par les verts, les pigments, c'est une matrice d'intervert où on peut bien voir même à l'œil ou au microscope l'inclusion des cristaux des, des cristaux des, des bleus égyptiens et il faut dire qu'on a détecté aussi la présence des soufres dans la, dans les, dans la, à côté des, des calcium à côté de la, des carbonates calciques calciques qui, qui nous indique la présence des plâtres comme euh, à côté des du carbonate calcique, et ce qui c'est une chose qui est très habituelle en Espagne, au moins à la vallée des lèvres. Parce que la vallée des lèvres est très riche à albâtre, et on l'utilise beaucoup pendant, pour, les, pour les mortiers depuis déjà de l'époque républicaine. On le trouve déjà dans les peintures du premier style. Et les rouges bordeaux, c'est en couleur très très basique, on n'a trouvé que des terres des ocre rouge. Alors, on peut, ne on peut rien dire, même qu'on a trouvé aussi les sulfates qui nous indiquent que ça existe un peu partout, là, partout les parois. Ce n'est pas une question d'un couloir ou d'autre. Et puis, les dernières couleurs, c'est les bleus. 
le blé, on voit à l'œil, on voit bien qu'il qu y a des, des, des cristaux de des blé ici, et les analystes nous indiquent que la présence des cuivres, alors on peut bien dire que c'est le blé égyptien, les féruléons, mais c'est que c'est très important que sous, les, sous ce blé égyptien, on trouve une sous-couche orangée, et les analystes nous ont donné l'exit, nous, nous ont euh, décelé, on dit, la présence des déminions. On voit les plombs. Alors, ce, que, ce, que, ce qui nous, nous a touché beaucoup, c'est qu'ils a, on a, euh, sont employés un pigment euh, rare, en principe, qui n'était pas, pas utilisé dans le reste de la paroi. C'est-à-dire les rouges et un rouge de matite, c'est un rouge de ocre, autant que pour la sous-couche du blé, on a utilisé les mignons. Alors, euh, par rapport au reste des peintures de, de, la, de, la, de la cité, on trouve trois cas différents de sous-couches. À l'époque claudienne, dans des panneaux et blé uni, on utilise, comme vous pouvez voir dans la, dans la diapositive, une sous-couche verte. Vous la pouvez voir à la, au coin de la diapositive. À la deuxième moitié du premier siècle, même dans des panneaux bleus unis, on utilise une couche grise. Alors, ce qu'on ce qu peut dire, c'est que à Bilbilis, quand on, peut, quand on peint en bleu égyptien les surfaces unies des panneaux médians, les artisans disposent toujours une sous-couche sous dont les pigments, les pigments n'est pas les mêmes. On constate l'existence des minions sur les peintures des années 30 avant Jésus-Christ, des terres vertes à l'époque claudienne et un, un pigment gris à la deuxième moitié du siècle. Pour finir, quelles sont les raisons de l'assistance de ces sous-couches Alors je propose trois hypothèses et je, et je pose la question à l'assemblée, la, à au colloque. Une façon, une façon d'économiser un pigment que la prévie trouve est cher, ça c'est la première hypothèse, qui est, qui est soutenue il y a quelques années par, par Madame Barbet. C'est une ressource thermique pour nuancer les bleus. C'est aussi une hypothèse soutenue par, surtout dans les publications, par Béarat et Mitchell Fuchs. Et finalement, c'est une ressource technique pour obtenir la correcte adhérence d'un pigment qui ne peut pas s'appliquer directement si la couche des mortiers est ou des chauds. Je laisse ouverte la question. Merci beaucoup. Schön. Wir haben heute schon einige interessante Vorträge gehört und ich habe auch viel gelernt. Ich werde in der Tradition das weitermachen und über eine Methode, I should stop fooling around, uh, and change to English, really. Um, you are afraid, then. Huh? <laughs> in any case, thank you very much. Um, I will tell you about um, our measurements that we uh, performed with the and our mouse. Uh, in Acolaneo, um, we measured below the wall paintings. We wanted to see the mortar stratigraphy, um, as there are already uh, quite a lot of um, very interesting methods uh, that can non structurally uh, monitor the surface. And fragments or parts of the wall restored or original, uh, like there is shown in the top right, uh, all of you probably have seen before. Um, so, repeating on this uh, would not make a lot of sense in my mind. Um, so, instead I, I want to um, go into uh, the, uh, the workings of the sensor that we use, uh, which is uh, luckily a non-destructive tool, uh, which I, I believe is, is very valuable as fragments like this, um, if they are subjected to um, a destructive or invasive approach, are in fact a, um, a finite resource and um, if we would only monitor the surface a lot of information and um, I think we have heard a lot of people confirming this would be lost. Um, this would be a shame I think. Um, so the way that our sensor works is um, it's about a shoebox size sensor that you can see in the picture here. I'm afraid it is a little bit small. Uh, sorry, but the post outside I think is very big, so that makes up for that. 
Um, it's uh, basically a permanent magnet approach. Uh, the permanent magnets will create a stray magnetic field that penetrates uh, the sample, in this case, either the fragments or the wall. Uh, and as there is, there is uh, only, only traces of, of, of uh, ferromagnetic material, uh, this magnetic stray field is, is rather uninhibited and just penetrates the sample as if it was air. Um, and in the same way that you could uh, generate an image in an in animal tom tomography uh, apparatus in a hospital, um, we are a uh, imaging approach. It is a one-dimensional imaging approach as we uh, acquire a thin slice uh, with our sensor that is um, roughly two and a half centimeters away from its surface. So without really touching the sample, we can move the sensor uh, next to the sample and retract it over, um, over the course of an experiment and we will measure uh, something like a 2 by 2 centimeter <coughs> square, which is roughly 100 to 150 micrometers thin. And what uh, we uh, the data that we generate with this uh, can, I think, best be shown in a picture like this, um, where we have saturated uh, a fragment, in this case, with distilled water. And as there is, of course, a lot of porosity, we've heard about this, and there are high capillary effects. Uh, we discussed this uh, in private a minute ago. Um, there is uh, a lot of potential uh, water uptake, and um, the contrast that we can measure is, of course, uh, basically water, uh, water content or, or water density in the different layers uh, into the sample. Um, and, of course, this is very, very heavily correlated with um, the, with the um, pore size distribution, with the distribution of uh, materials that were used, of course. Uh, we, do, we do not provide any chemical information, but as the chemicals and the composition of, of uh, and also the way uh, the material was applied make up a lot of these properties, we do get uh, indirect information about the stratigraphy. Um, so we acquired over 60 profiles in the course of, I think, more than uh, five or six trips to, to um, uh, Italy. Um, and of course, we measured different houses um, in Ercolano. We measured um, a, a bathhouse, for example. We measured a uh, wealthy uh, villa. Um, and we measured some, some assorted fragments. And um, also, we made our own mockups to compare them with this data. Um, in the end, we of course saw that there is some correlation of some of them. They, there seems to be a lot of overlap. The profiles that we acquired uh, are similar in some cases. Uh, in others, they are not. And the approach that we chose to analyze this for the future um, is um, what you may refer to as chemometrics. I don't really like uh, the term, as I think it's confusing. Uh, I like the term pattern recognition. Um, so we use a very uh, valuable tool of pattern recognition, which is PCA, um, or Principal Component Analysis. Um, and we um, kind of analyzed, unsupervised, um, we analyzed all of the profiles uh, into, and, and, and here, of course, uh, if you've ever dealt with PCA, uh, then you are aware that the distance between the points uh, is roughly proportional to the similarity of the data sets. Uh, and here we used, actually, um, the data each of, each, each of the points that we acquire uh, across the depths here is seen as one observable uh, property or um, very similar to uh, when PCA is done with, with uh, spectra. Uh, this could also be seen as a spectra that is then fed into the PCA algorithm. Um, and of course this information is very exciting uh, and it allows us to, to make uh, conclusions about um, how profiles or how different houses uh, seem to um, <coughs> exhibit the same style of, of, of wall making. 
Um, but we also wanted to go one step further and we uh, applied a uh, supervised method of pattern recognition where uh, we externally input um, classes. Um, so that means that we told the algorithm, okay, uh, some of your points belong together, you are from one house, uh, and this allows us not only to get a scatter of all of the points, but also a scatter between different um, classes. So if we see, for example, that uh, here in a uh, rather um, poor people's apartment house is overlapping with the Villa Papiri, a house that is uh, or was inhabited by wealthy people, then, of course, this tells us uh, that, that um, there is still information to be gained from what is underneath um, maybe an old uh, painting, an old wall painting. Um, maybe it wasn't always used as an, as a, uh, as an, as an apartment house for poor people. Maybe uh, at some point it was, in fact, something much nicer or um, inhabited by uh, wealthy people. And uh, yeah, we see a lot of potential in this uh, in this analysis, and this is what we are gonna pursue further. Thank you. Uh, well, so first of all, of course, thank you very much for organizing this conference um, for inviting me. Because to be honest, I've just gotten dipping my toes, so to say, into the materiality of wall paintings. So for me, this conference was a sort of uh, one-day advanced curve. So thank you very much for having me here today. And as you can see, what I was trying to do with this uh, poster is to try, because it's just, I'm just trying, to get an idea of not just what were the kind of materials involved in, and technique involved into the creation of wall paintings, but also how long did it take to paint, to plaster and paint a wall. Uh, it's, it's a complicated topic and, and because, as you all know, we don't have any kind of documentary resources helping us with this specific task. We have basically no idea about how long did it take to paint a specific wall. And most scholars assume that it was done pretty quickly because of the fresco techniques and so on, but uh, at the end of the day, we just don't know. And since my, my PhD thesis is, what, is focusing on trying to reconstruct uh, workforce organizations and also possibly what were the living standards of uh, the specific craft, the craft people involved in the creation of wall painting, I thought that was an important uh, topic to at least try and have a look at. So, this is the result for just a specific wall in the Casa di Pittoria Lavoro in Pompeii. Uh, you all know about his specific domus. And of course, you can understand why they decided to pick this one because since the the decoration was left unfinished, it helped me in uh, the uh, reconstruction of uh, the different uh, steps and, uh, and of the whole process as a result. And in order to try and estimate the uh, plaster time necessary to cover this wall, I. Um, I had to turn to a uh, different kind of source. So I turned to post-antique uh, post post sources, specifically uh, building manuals uh, written in the uh, 19th and early 20th century. Uh, I know it, it sounds strange, but uh, to be honest, in that period, a lot of manuals were uh, Printed dealing with uh, the materials, actions, and times involved with the production of a wide number of building activities. And the technique used back then are actually pretty close to the ones <coughs> used by uh, Romans. So I, I did something similar to what Delane did for the uh, Bath of Caracalla. I, I, I'm, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with that work. So I took as many uh, building manuals as I could and I tried to come up with an average by studying them. You can see uh, like here, this is a representation of uh, the plus green times uh, expressed in one centimeter thickness for one square meter. And I came up with an average. I used that average to try and get an idea of how long would it take uh, to plaster a T-specific wall, the north wall of room 12 in the Casa di Vittoria Lavoro. And, and, and uh, well, um, about the painting times, I use again a different a number of different sources. And I, like, probably the main one was the experimental first executed in San Saban in 1996 under the direction of, oops, sorry, <laughs> of Madame Barbet. So you, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and so this is the final result. Uh, uh, so probably to cover this specific wall that was uh, almost 25 uh, square meters big, uh, we a team composed of two plasterers and three painters. Uh, it will probably take, at the very <coughs> least, eight days. That will, this is a sort of minimum estimate. And so if the same number of people were employed at the same time on every single wall within this room, then it will take 15 days, more or less, to plaster and paint the whole room. So it's, it's from one point of view, it's, it's oh. fairly quick. But from another point of view, it's, it's not as quick as some scholars tend to assume because uh, the, the walls were not... Uh, like the, the technique employed was a mixture of fresco and seco technique, otherwise it wouldn't be impossible to just carry out the whole work. And after, like, the whole reason why I did this, to be honest, is to then see if I could get an idea of uh, the costs involved into creating this kind of heart, especially since it's next to impossible to get an idea of the cost of pigments, the, the labor costs involved. And to do so, of course, the only source I could turn to is uh, the Oculus Edict, which I'm absolutely... Uh, I'm. I am absolutely aware it refers to a very specific time and a very specific economy in a way, but just to get a vague idea of uh, how, uh, how expensive it, it is, it, it was to, to, just, to have one wall painted, I also try to calculate uh, the, the wages of uh, the people involved in the whole process and it comes out that uh, to, of course this is an estimate again, I want to stress it as much as I can, and in order to, uh, like the amount of money necessary to pay these two plasterers and three painters working, working on just one wall for eight days was more than 200 denarii, which does, doesn't mean anything as it is, but to translate it in more sort of understandable terms, this is the uh, with this amount of money, the money to just uh, pay the people painting one wall in eight days. With this amount of money, a family of three could live respectably for 50 days and survive on the bare minimum for four months. So this is. This is just to get an idea of uh, times and costs involved in uh, this kind of uh, production. And this is it for now. I hopefully will work more on it in order to understand more about how these people organize their work and what the, their living standards were like and so on. But for now, this is it. <laughs> and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I also would like to thank the organizers of this meeting very much because I've been very much looking forward to a meeting like this. Um, what I'm presenting in this poster um, is a part of a larger research project that I'm conducting on technique of execution of late antique and early Byzantine wall paintings in the Levant, and that comprises sites, archaeological sites from modern day Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel. And um, I'm focusing on wall paintings from roughly 4th, 5th, and 6th century, which to a lot of people appears peculiar because there aren't many paintings from that period, and if there are, they're usually fragments and they are not so attractive when you look at Roman period paintings from this area because if there are some Roman paintings found on an archaeological site everyone is like wow let's go and analyze them or let's look at them and uh, all the paintings from later periods are usually uh, just uh, ignored or discarded and I think <laughs> it's a big mistake because it is really interesting to look at their technique of execution as well, because I believe that the changes in technique of execution which occurred in late antiquity and early Byzantine period is probably one of the major reasons why they don't survive in a good condition. So, um, I've been um, in this research project, basically I'm going to a number of sites, I look at what they found there, I, I don't sample everything, I usually start from microsco uh, macroscopic examination and then I take some samples if I find it uh, reasonable. And one of the sites is the site of Schim in Lebanon, which was excavated by Polish archaeological mission a few years ago, actually about 10 years ago. And uh, there are two sanctuaries, two places of worship. At this site there is a Roman temple and an early Christian church, and both of them yielded fragments of wall paintings. So I found it's a great opportunity to study both of them and to compare how the technique of their execution changed uh, within this, well, 300, 400 years uh, time span. So, um, actually I might just exit this mode, and I want to do like this. Is it okay? It's still not much better, but <laughs> maybe you'll see something. Uh, so, like the first striking difference is, of course, their condition. The Roman period paintings survived pretty well. We can tell they are in fragments, but we can study their iconography or try to put them together. Whereas the early Byzantine paintings are, you know, you can hardly call them paintings. It is you can't even tell what they represented, and they pretty much fall apart when when you pick them up and um, so that's the first thing that strikes when you look at them and then I looked at the at the substrate layer buildup and there are two main differences between these two monuments uh, the early Byzantine wall paintings are executed on I mean the substrate layers are much thinner um, than their Roman counterparts in the Roman period uh, paintings, the, the first layer was quite thick, it was up to 8 centimeters. Um, whereas uh, in the early Byzantine uh, church, there, were, there was actually one preparatory layer of mortar, it's the layer B. And only in the deepest irregularities of the masonry, they applied another type of mortar, but it wasn't it wasn't applied to the entire wall, it was just in the, deep, the deepest interstices. And then this other, so it's it's only locally, it occurs only locally. Uh, and also in case of the early Byzantine uh, paintings, the topmost layer, the intonaco, was pretty thick or the, uh, maybe it shouldn't be called the intonaco, the layer that was painted, um, it was pretty thick, it was like, I mean, relatively to the Roman period, it was about five millimeters, whether in the Roman period it was about one millimeter. 
But in terms of the materials used for preparation of those mortars and plasters, they weren't really much different. The only material that was used in the Roman period and was not used in the early Byzantine period was calcite. Um, so I would say that was the primary <coughs> difference. Um, what else? Also, the um, binder aggregate ratio didn't change that much. It was slightly higher in terms in the case of, uh, of the early Byzantine wall paintings than in the Roman paintings. And um, what I noticed is that there is a certain consequence of the composition of, of, the, of the mortars uh, maintained also later, which is that the uh, lowermost layer both in the Roman temple and in the church, I mean the layer A and layer B, in this case, they both contained only crushed limestone as the principal aggregate, and they were both followed by a layer which contained uh, calcite, uh, sorry, not calcite, but quartz and uh, some crushed uh, limestone. So maybe we may say that there was some kind of co concept that was maintained until this 5th century of this, this kind of sequence of layers. Um, when we look at the paint layers, um, I didn't do much research on the early Byzantine paint layers, I just did the uh, paint layer stratigraphy and analyzed uh, yellow and red pigment because there, there were no other pigments and I don't know whether it was because they didn't use other pigments or they just didn't survive because the early Byzantine wall paintings were in really bad condition. Um, I would like to, if it was, uh, I would like to look, I'd be curious to, to see what kind of green they used in 5th, 6th century because in the Roman temple the green that I identified is of course green earth and it's celadonite, which does not occur in the Levant, and it was imported from <coughs> Cyprus. And it would be uh, interesting to see if in the early Byzantine period they also used imported celadonite, or did they use perhaps glauconite, which is locally available. But I couldn't do that because there was no green <laughs> in this case. Also in case of the Roman paintings, there were some preparatory marks visible on the plaster, like some incisions or the snapped, snapped line made by a cord. Um, so, while well, there was certainly much more material to look at in the case of the Roman period uh, paintings. Um, well, to conclude, I, I see and I actually saw it um, in earlier presentations and it was quite interesting, it was very interesting to see how certain motif reappears over and over again that in the later periods um, basically the materials that were used for preparation of the mortars didn't change but the way of their application and preparation changed and it means that they just, it just, it's not the fault of the materials, of different materials, it's the fault of the people who for some reason didn't know maybe how to do it or they didn't have as much time or whatever, they had some other restrictions, time restrictions or, or so on, or, or something like this. Um, in case of Shim, um, I need to emphasize that, you know, it was, it was a village, it wasn't any kind of big urban center. So whoever made those paintings had to be brought from somewhere. Um, it is possible that there were artists from Sidon. It's the closest major. It was the closest major city in antiquity. And um, what else can I tell you? Uh, I've looked at several other um, sites in Lebanon, but that was the only one where where I could compare the Roman and the early Byzantine uh, wall paintings and actually in exactly a week from now I'll be flying to Jordan to look at some sites there so hopefully there will be more opportunities like this to, to carry out this kind of research. So I don't know if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, that's it I think, thank you. Euh, alors, 
pour euh, présenter de, très rapidement euh, notre poster commun. Donc l'objectif était de mettre en parallèle deux études de cas, euh, une, assez, une, une issue d'une étude assez récente, une l'autre de fouilles euh, plus anciennes, euh, mais dont, sur lesquelles les, les observations euh, semblaient converger. Euh, et de proposer, donc je l'ai déjà dit au cours de la journée, c'est encore à, donc à un stade très préliminaire par rapport à, aux travaux qui ont été montrés ici, c'est-à-dire que ce sont simplement des observations macroscopiques, mais qui nous semblaient déjà permettre, euh, apporter des données et permettre d'élaborer une réflexion, de proposer des pistes euh, d'interprétation. Le premier cas d'étude est celui de la fouille de la euh, supposée que nature rotonde sur le sur le Balatin, fouillé par Françoise Villieu depuis 2009, euh, et qui a donc livré enfin, les, les niveaux de, de comblement de la structure néronienne, ont livré un ensemble assez important d'enduits fragmentaires, euh, très hétérogènes, très étalés dans la stratigraphie euh, et, et la chronologie. Mais ce qui est apparu de manière assez claire, c'est que euh, les enduits qui portaient des décors, euh, alors des décors de premier, euh, deuxième et peut-être troisième style, mais c'est vraiment sur des détails stylistiques assez légers, donc c'est le premier style qui est le plus aisé à identifier. Euh, D'un côté, et ceux qui portaient des décors euh, de l'époque flavienne et après, euh, présentaient des différences macroscopiques, enfin, à, à l'œil nu, d'évidentes différences de composition euh, dans les mortiers, euh, en particulier, euh, comme on l'a déjà vu plusieurs fois, de la couche euh, de finition, beaucoup plus épaisse, beaucoup plus chargée euh, en calcite, euh, et également des niveaux de, de préparation avec, dans, dans tous les cas, là, sur cet ensemble, euh, une matrice très blanche et euh, des sables volcaniques noirs euh, qui faisaient un mortier très très résistant, très, très solide. Et donc du côté des enduits plus, plus tardifs, une couche de finition comme vous voyez euh, euh, à l'écran. Euh, Beaucoup plus, beaucoup plus fine, moins solide et un mortier beaucoup plus hétérogène euh, et, et irrégulier. Euh, donc on a une géométrie beaucoup plus irrégulière donc dans les couches de préparation. Pour le piazza, je... Alors pour le piazza, le, 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 euh, le schéma est globalement le même, sinon que c'est une étude qui a été faite en 98, 97, 98, 98 euh, donc il y a fort longtemps déjà. Euh, avec euh, une visée bien particulière, c'était donc dans le cadre des fouilles de l'école française de Rome sur le piazza de la Villa Médicis, et euh, c'est un lieu qui a été terriblement bouleversé, déjà dans l'Antiquité, puis évidemment euh, dans les périodes successives et à la Renaissance. Et il euh, y a eu déjà des apports de terrain de toute évidence dans l'Antiquité, de sorte que euh, le matériel ne provient non seulement pas de là, mais même probablement de loin. Euh, donc la première, euh, le, le défi en fait, euh, était d'arriver à trier ce matériel et de le trier, évidemment ce sont des fragments très petits, euh, et de le trier sur les critères techniques. Euh, donc c'est à, à la suite de, 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 de cela que nous avons, avec Alexandra Dardenay, euh, essayé de mettre en place euh, des disons, euh, un certain nombre de critères. Euh, parmi ces critères euh, de différenciation, il y avait bien sûr l'aspect du liant et euh, la présence de sable volcanique euh, extrêmement euh, résistant et très, euh, qui donnait évidemment un, un aspect très sombre aux, aux couches de préparation. Euh, et d'autre part, et ça c'était très important, la nature de la charge, la nature de l'agrégat. Et donc, à la suite de discussions avec Arnaud Coutela qui était venu euh, voir ça, euh, nous avions euh, distingué en fait euh, trois grands types. Euh, donc, du sable fossile, du sable de carrière à, à granulométrie euh, variable à arêtes vives, euh, du sable de rivière ou de lac, et le lac de Polsena n'est pas loin naturellement, euh, et ensuite des éclats de tuf. Euh, de sorte que, bon, un certain nombre de types ont été euh, identifiés. Euh, et chronologiquement, avec le très très peu de euh, critères stylistiques que nous pouvions avoir, c'est-à-dire dans certains cas euh, des, euh, des bordures à jouer, des éléments de bordure à jouer, donc ça voilà, c'est au moins un, un, un motif clé, euh, de, donc 
un certain nombre de, euh, de trois, trois grandes catégories en fait, ont pu être euh, mises en place. Euh, donc d'une part les décors du premier siècle euh, à euh, donc, euh, mortier, couche de préparation très sombre, très chargée en sable volcanique, intonaco, intonacino, euh, selon la terminologie italienne, euh, épais et très résistant, très chargé en poudre de marbre, ou en calcite, mais enfin, souvent euh, en tout cas épais, euh, et sable fossile. Puis visiblement à l'époque d'Adrien, euh, une petite modification, l'intonacino devient plus, un peu plus mince, euh, il est ou n'est pas chargé en euh, calcite ou poudre de marbre, ça dépend du euh, statut, je dirais, des décors, euh, et le sable volcanique, enfin le liant, euh, le liant volcanique, la puzzolane, euh, est moins dense. Donc on a des mortiers, des couches de préparation grisâtres, euh, puis qui tendent de plus en plus, effectivement, à s'éclaircir. Et puis à, à partir de l'époque sévérienne, on va dire, euh, ce qui a été confirmé sur d'autres sites de, de, du Pinchio, euh, le, la puzzolane disparaît, la poudre de marbre disparaît d'une zone aquino qui devient de plus en plus mince, euh, et on n'a plus, euh, pratiquement, on a essentiellement comme charge, comme granulat, des éclats de tuf. Donc, c'est un, un, un cadre qu'on retrouve tout à fait dans ce qu'on a vu euh, au cours de cette journée, qui reste évidemment dans le, dans le cadre du, du, du Piazzal. Euh, euh, pas plus distinct que ça, puisqu'on on manque totalement euh, d'informations euh, sur la globalité des décors, mais euh, dans le cas de, de Rome, on retrouve quand même un schéma euh, cohérent. Et très rapidement, en, en conclusion, donc on, on avait essayé, donc à partir de ce cadre très, très préliminaire, de, de voir quelles étaient les grandes étapes, et donc j'ai déjà en, par en parlé en particulier de ce changement qui a d'intervenir dans le courant de la seconde moitié du 1er siècle après Jésus-Christ, euh, que nous avons mis en relation avec le grand incendie de Rome euh, et sans doute la phase de très intense activité militaire qui, 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 qui a dû suivre, et ensuite une, une étape à l'époque euh, sévérienne. Euh, et en conclusion, euh, et Hélène, notamment, et, et, Hélène et Alexandra ont insisté après leur étude sur la nécessité de euh, créer un... Un tessonnier. Euh, alors euh, réel ou virtuel, mais on revient un peu sur euh, les discussions qu'on a eues aujourd'hui, qui permettraient euh, déjà pour Rome euh, d'avoir des éléments de référence, euh, comme on fait en céramique, et de pouvoir comparer euh, euh, tel type d'édifice, telle époque, telle, etc. Innanzitutto anche a nome delle altre autrici desidero ringraziare Marco Cavalieri, Paolo Tommasini e tutti gli altri organizzatori di questa giornata per averci offerto l'occasione di presentare alcuni dei primi risultati delle indagini effettuate da un'equipe di ricerca composta da archeologi e archeometri sugli intonaci dipinti, finora inediti, della villa romana di Cottanello che si trova in provincia di Rieti, nel Lazio. E dell'edificio, come si vede nella planimetria in alto, è noto parzialmente solo il settore residenziale, portato alla luce negli anni 69-72, che si articola intorno a un atrio, un peristilio, è dotato di un impianto termale, di un criptoportico ed è arricchito da una pregevole decorazione musiva pavimentale, da affreschi parietali e da una decorazione architettonica fittile. La storia della villa si articola in tre fasi principali. La più antica, di età tardo repubblicana, eh, documentata da materiali oltre che da alcune strutture, è obliterata dall'edificio attualmente visibile, che si riferisce alla prima metà del I secolo d.C., pur con alcune aggiunte e rifacimenti successivi. Il, il rinvenimento di un, di un bollo su un orlo di dolio ha permesso inoltre di ricondurre la villa di questa fase alla nobile famiglia degli Aureli Cotte. E la villa presenta ancora una frequentazione in età tarda antica tra IV e VI secolo. Dopo alcune ricerche promosse dalla sovrintendenza che hanno portato alla realizzazione nel 2000 di un'importante pubblicazione scientifica a cura di Mara Sternini, soltanto nel 2010 sono state intraprese indagini stratigrafiche mirate in alcuni settori della villa ad opera della Sapienza Università di Roma sotto la direzione di Fabrizio Pensabene. 
A partire dal 2013 l'Istituto di Studi sul Mediterraneo Antico del Consiglio Nazionale delle Ricerche Italiano ha avviato un progetto di ricerca in collaborazione con la Sapienza, la Sovrintendenza e il supporto del Comune di Cottanello. In particolare, per il tema che ci interessa, è stato approfondito lo scavo di un ambiente, il 25, che appartiene al settore termale. Questo ambiente non conservava la pavimentazione ed era stato interessato solo nella parte superficiale dai primi scavi. E quindi è stato possibile documentare una stratigrafia costituita da un accumulo di materiali pertinenti alla distruzione di un impianto a adipocausto, tra cui sono stati rinvenuti numerosissimi frammenti di intonaci varietali provenienti da ambienti diversi. Oltre agli scavi archeologici, le ricerche disciplinari <coughs> avviate dall'Istituto di Studi sul Mediterraneo Antico prevedono attività, attività diagnostiche di supporto allo studio del sito e dei materiali, condotte da ricercatori del CNR, dell'Istituto per la conservazione e la valorizzazione dei beni culturali, dell'Istituto per le tecnologie applicate ai beni culturali, dell'Istituto di struttura della materia e dell'Istituto di geologia ambientale e geoingegneria, insieme a ricercatori della Sapienza, dell'Università Suor Orsola Benincasa di Napoli e di esperti esterni. A questo punto lascio la parola alla collega Francesca Golosi, che illustrerà i risultati preliminari di queste ricerche anche a nome degli altri colleghi dell'equip e in particolare di Fernanda Prestileo che ha curato la parte relativa alle analisi scientifiche ma che purtroppo non, può essere, non è qui presente. Allora, in primo luogo è stato effettuato il censimento di tutti i dipinti murali ancora conservati in situ. Per ciascun ambiente si è proceduto al rilevamento delle alterazioni presenti sulle superfici dipinte, classificandone in tipologia e distribuzione. A questo scopo è stata utilizzata una scheda speditiva di censimento conservativo facendo riferimento al lessico del degrado, così come indicato dalla normativa sia nazionale che internazionale. I dipinti murali presenti in quasi tutti gli ambienti della villa a livello dello zoccolo e li vedete indicati con linee rosse sulla pianta in alto, sono molto deteriorati, anche a causa di un restauro con malta cementizia che è stato effettuato negli anni 70 del secolo scorso. Le decorazioni, quando sono ancora conservate, consistono in grandi campiture di colore rosso, nero, bordeaux, a volte giallo, delimitate a livello del pavimento, da fasce di colore diverso a guisa di battiscopa. La partizione regolare della parete è ben visibile per esempio nell'ambiente 9 dove una serie di pannelli di colore rosso è delimitata da listelli azzurro-verde con un'ornata dentro. Dallo scavo dell'ambiente 25 della villa proviene una notevolissima quantità di frammenti di un tonaco, sono più di 4.000 frammenti, dei quali 734 caratterizzati da un motivo decorativo ancora riconoscibile. I materiali sono stilisticamente omogenei nonostante la varietà di colori ed elementi decorativi e sono confrontabili con gli intonaci ancora in situ. Si tratta cioè di pannelli di diverso colore, delimitati da fasce di stelli tripartiti, caratteristici, così come i colori utilizzati, delle composizioni parietali di terzo stile. Alcune decorazioni più complesse, che è stato ricostruire solo possibile fare? ricostruire solo parzialmente, qui vediamo un esempio, si collocano anch'esse tra il tardo terzo e il quarto stile pompeiano. In generale l'insieme dei lacerti pittorici rivela una certa standardizzazione degli schemi decorativi che risultano ripetizioni di modelli generalmente attestati a Roma e nelle città vesuviane in età Claudio Neroniana in concordanza cronologica quindi con la prima fase di inizio della via. Su 14 campioni selezionati rappresentativi delle principali cromie è stato condotto uno studio archi archeometrico per la caratterizzazione dei materiali costituenti lo strato pittorico. L'indagine è stata svolta sia su frammenti di dipinto tal quali che su sezioni lucide allo scopo di indagarne la sequenza staticatica. Le acquisizioni delle sezioni lucide sono state eseguite con uno stereo microscopio a differenti ingrandimenti. In una seconda fase le sezioni lucide sono state acquisite mediante microfluorescenza raggi X, i campioni tal quali sono stati analizzati anche mediante spettroscopia in XRF utilizzando uno spettrometro portatile. Infine tutti i campioni sono stati esaminati mediante spettroscopia rama. Nel poster sono illustrati i risultati delle diverse tecniche di analisi, 
di analisi impiegate per lo studio di campioni rossi e azzurri che a nostro avviso hanno fornito i dati più interessanti. Il rosso è uno dei colori più ricorrenti nei frammenti di intonaco ritrovati. Le analisi hanno evidenziato la presenza ubiquitaria di, oca, di ocra rossa, ovvero ematite con impurità argillose, utilizzata da sola o insieme al cinabro. L'esame delle sezioni lucide ha evidenziato come i due pigmenti, cioè l'ocra rossa e il cinabro, siano stati talvolta mescolati insieme, come nel campione 4, oppure disposti su due strati, con l'ocra presente sullo strato sottostante. Il blu presente sui campioni è composto principalmente da rame ed è quindi verosimilmente attribuibile al blu egizio. In particolare, in un campione, lo strato blu è dato su base di calce senza un fondo scuro, mentre in un altro lo strato di blu sembra essere sovrapposto a uno strato di ocra gialla. E ritorniamo di nuovo al campione 13. L'impiego del cinabro del blu egizio denota una certa competenza e ricercatezza nella tecnica pittorica eh, in questa villa per così dire periferica oltre che un impegno economico specialmente nel caso del blu egizio sembra che questi due pigmenti forse proprio per, per ragioni economiche in questo caso siano stati utilizzati non per intere campiture ma per dipingere particolari e delimita e de delimitati elementi decorativi anche tramite una stesura successiva di rifinitura Ecco, questi sono solo i primi risultati, come diceva Carla, di una ricerca che è ancora all'inizio e che intendiamo sviluppare ulteriormente, anche con l'analisi delle malte. Per quanto riguarda i pigmenti, è nostra intenzione effettuare le analisi archeometriche su alcuni campioni pertinenti a frammenti di intonaci dipinti venuti alla luce nel corso degli anni, degli anni 70 e tra questi numerosi lacerti appaiono relativi a pannelli bugnati delimitati dagli stelli ribassati dipinti con colori intensi tipici del primo e secondo stile pompeiano offrendo quindi una testimonianza della prima fase costruttiva della villa ugualmente sarà fondamentale applicare le stesse tecniche analitiche unitamente ad altre quali SEM e FTIR su microcampioni di pellicola pittorica provenienti dall'intonaci ancora in situ Infatti anche in questo caso, vista la presenza di diverse fasi costruttive, abbiamo ad esempio evidenziato alcune tamponature sulle quali è stato applicato l'intonaco che potrebbero essere pertinenti a una fase tarda, l'analisi potrà fornirci indicazione sull'eventuale evoluzione della tecnica pittorica nel corso del tempo. Iniziamo! So thank you very much, we go to the closing and uh, here we are presenting just a a small section of a large project. It's a project led by the University of Padua about uh, the old building of the Sarno Baths. And uh, according to the decoration of this large building, for who is not very familiar with Pompeii, we are at the border of the town. Uh, and this is one of the buildings we can see all around the city walls. Uh, Uh, built on different levels, uh, and this is a huge building built on five, uh, five floors. Uh, according to the decoration, we decided to focus on one single room for making an overall interpretation of the process of making and at the same time of the decoration itself. And uh, we decided to start from the direct observation And uh, after that, we went to, into the stylistic study, into the study of uh, the tool marks, the study of the way the decoration was made. And after that, uh, the colleagues from uh, the Department of uh, Geological Sciences are doing the characterization of the paintings. For this poster, we are showing some results about the application of digital reconstruction. So we, we try to push a little bit further this kind of application because what we see usually is uh, the reconstruction of the decoration. Most of the times uh, wall paintings are found just in fragments uh, and uh, we need a graphical restitution of the decoration. Our idea was uh, What about representing also the process? What about representing the different stages of the work? 
uh, starting from laying the plaster and ending with uh, the final decoration. And this case study was really a really good one because uh, the decoration is complex. We have uh, a portion of quite well-preserved decoration, but also lots of lost, totally lost decoration. Uh, we have a complex technique involving both paintings and plaster works. Uh, I can show you here uh, a detail of the room. This is the northern wall. We are in the frigidarium and this is the pool for uh, the cold water. And this wall was decorated dividing uh, the wall into sections uh, and uh, at the center of the wall there was a fake architecture. Here we are in uh, the Pompeian fort style. And as you can see the wall is badly damaged because uh, the lead pipes uh, uh, were taken away after the eruption of the Vesuvius. So, so this is a damage that occurred in antiquity because uh, after the eruption some buildings in Pompeii remained uh, outside the layers of the eruption for some time. So here we are on the slopes of the hill facing the Sarno River and not all the building uh, remained under uh, the layers of the eruption. Uh, the first work we did uh, was trying to do a stratigraphy of the application of color on the wall. And uh, what we could see immediately is uh, that the concept of working here is the same concept we've been uh, talking about uh, since this morning. Uh, we have large areas uh, decorated uh, applying the color of fresco and after that, on this uh, underpainting, uh, we have the application of different layers in different colors uh, applied, uh, likely a secco. And we will clarify this with the analysis, but also with the direct observation, we can also see the thickness uh, of, uh, of the paintbrush. So we can, uh, we can observe very well that we have a combination of fresco and secco. And uh, this, uh, with this image, uh, you can see this area. For example, uh, we are inside the pool, it's just painted in blue. So this is a direct application of the blue on the, using the fresco technique. Then we have a frieze uh, decorated with an ailotic scene with pygmies. And this is very badly preserved, but we could uh, do some reconstruction of the decoration. And here we have a blue base applied a fresco, and then all the scene is painted uh, in a second time. And again, this other section, uh, a yellow, a yellow base, and on top a red one, and on top all the fake architecture. And finally, on the upper part of the wall, uh, we have the white. And uh, this is where they didn't paint at all. They just left blank the color of, uh, of the plaster. And uh, you, you might see here, with the, because the images are bigger, uh, all the borders are made uh, uh, in plaster work. And they were combining different, different patterns. Uh, what did we do with our work? Uh, we worked on different levels. The first and uh, the most important for starting to have a general view of the, of the room was the reconstruction of the overall decoration of the room. Of course, we can do it safely in some parts, not safely in other parts, so after uh, drawing the general layout, uh, some of uh, the panels are left uh, just blank because we have no idea of the figures filling uh, uh, the panels. And uh, another work we, we could do is uh, a virtual conservation. What we have now, the current situation, is a wall full of salt. And uh, sometimes it's really hard to observe well the decoration uh, using uh, simply 
uh, Photoshop, this, uh, the image was virtually cleaned so we can appreciate better uh, the colors and the images and also the missing parts were filled using the color like a conservator would do doing integration with watercolor. And again, this is uh, the last part of the work and this part uh, is at uh, the beginning but we are planning to get to a conclusion in a couple of months, uh, is the study of tool marks. Uh, observing the walls, uh, we could see different tool marks because we have the guidelines for organizing the decoration of the room, but we have, especially according to plasters, uh, we have also the use of molds. Uh, and those molds are leaving uh, very clear marks. For example, here we have a border with waves. We can see very well the junction between one mold and the second stamped mold, so we could draw a real size uh, reproduction of the molds. And also because we could see the wooden grains on the surface, we can also say very safely the molds in this case were made in wood. Uh, finally, what uh, is going to happen next? Uh, we will draw the decoration according to the different stages of the work. So we will represent uh, graphically all the process. And also we are planning to do a 3D reconstruction in a way that we will be able to explore the, the room as virtually entry inside the Frigidarium. Thank you.